But this is my daughter, Shelly Brim, and we're in uh, Collinsville, Oklahoma. We're on the platform of a glorious church fellowship. And uh, praise the Lord, a great church pastored by Chip and Candace Brim, great congregation. Uh, this is our fifth lesson on anti-Semitism. And today we're going to look at it uh, in one of the forms it takes, replacement theology. I was recently down with uh, Diana and John Hagee, and he prayed with me about Migdalar Bell. It's going to be a place where we teach the truth. It's so important to get God's truth to God's people so that they don't walk on the devil's side. And so he prayed um, for our school, and he said uh, that they would, that this damnable doctrine of replacement, of replacement theology, theology would be taught against and people's minds would be cleared up about it. You probably don't even realize how you've been affected by it. Now, in a brief statement, can you define replacement well, theology? Well, that's what we're going to talk about right okay, now. Okay, great. The because, whole time we're talking about it. All right, good. Replacement theology, much harm has been done by something that arose in the early days after Rome adopted Christianity. It's a long story, but something known as replacement theology came into being. It taught that God was through with the Jews and all the promises made to them now belong to the universal church, i.e. the Roman church. All the curses, however, were still meant for the Jews. Now I'm going to read to you from uh, J.M. Carroll and his book, The Trail of Blood. A.D. 313, 313, actually Shelley, about for 300 years, they walked in a simple doctrine the way Jesus taught it. But then something happened. Uh, a new emperor had come to the throne of the Roman Empire. Christ, uh, Constantine reported a, a, that he'd had a wonderful, realistic vision. He saw in the skies a fiery red cross, and on that cross written in fiery letters, by this sign thou shalt conquer. He interpreted it to mean that he should become a Christian. And that by attaching the spiritual power to, of the Christian religion onto the temporal power of the Roman Empire, the world could be easily conquered. Thus, the Christian religion would become a whole world religion and the Roman Empire a whole world. So he's going to conquer the world. And they actually um, declare on one day tomorrow, you wake up, you're a Roman citizen, you are a Christian. To effectually bring about and consummate this unholy union of the Roman Empire with Christianity, a council was called. He had to call the council. He called the council of the bishops. A call was made for the coming together of all the bishops of the Christian churches or their representatives. Not all came, but some did. A hierarchy was formed and Constantine made its head. He was not even a Christian at the time. He didn't become a Christian until at his death. Because they decided in their councils that it was baptism that saved you. You need to be baptized at birth. You need to be baptized at death. He didn't know which one. And he probably do a lot of sin in between, so he waited till death. Uh, they had the first council in A.D. 325 at Nice or, the, or Nicaea, the Nicene Council. 318 bishops came. Not all of them came. Eight council doctrines were established. And uh, it was decreed that the Bible, God's book, uh, well, here's why they decreed it. Some of, the, some of the people said, huh, Rome? Constantine? Maybe he's the Antichrist. And so that's what the book of Revelation so the councils decided they'll take the book of Revelation out of the Bible. Well, that wouldn't go down. No, not even the councils that went, many of the councils. So what they're going to do, they're going to take all the Bible and they're going to lock it away. It's denied to laymen. All members of the Catholic churches other than the priests or higher officials. Any, anybody, only the priests and the higher officials. And so they, you, they read the word to you, maybe even in Latin, and you can understand it. You don't know what's going on. You don't know what's written there. And they tell you that uh, God tried with the Jews, but they didn't work. So now it's the Roman church. Uh, there's no salvation. This is one of their decrees. There's no salvation outside the Roman church. And substantiation. Uh, they decreed that means that the actual bread and water, bread and wine, uh, the body of Christ becomes that. And so um, at later they decreed to extirpate, extirpate all heresy. 
What a black page that was. Many black pages have been written, but one of the worst was that decree. And of course, that uh, came about too in the uh, Spanish Inquisition. Heresy had to be cleansed from the church. They became heresy hunters. Now, uh, Shelley, I came across a little uh, book, old book, came into my hands. God, thank you for it. Written by William L. Pettingill. It's named Israel's Jehovah's Covenant People, and uh, it was written in 1936. Shelley, would you please, uh, I think even go ahead and read that first paragraph. Okay. Now keep in mind that when he writes, it's like a tongue-in-cheek dry humor, you know, as he's writing. Keep that in mind. So quoting William, the Jews have been at once the most highly honored and the most basically dishonored nation in the history of the world. Honored of God, dishonored of men. God loves the Jews, men hate them. It was always so. Men have always hated what God loved and loved what he hated. In all the history of mankind, there is no nation which has been the object of such unremitting, general, and relentless persecutions as the Jews to say nothing of the notorious persecutions to which they have been subjected. In now, now we're going to go into something. He's writing this in 1936. Wow, Hitler, Hitler. is okay. rising. And so he's going to mention the Dreyfus trial, trial. Oh, yes. That was in 1987. He's going to mention some things that are happening at that time. So destroy Israel? Yeah, so, so and he knows they aim to destroy Israel. So okay. now take up with so there. quoting William Pettingill. And his words, destroy Israel, you might as well try to destroy God himself. <laughs> his word cannot be broken. Much mischief has been wrought by the process of scripture interpretation falsely called spiritualizing. A much more descriptive word would be de-spiritualizing or Vaporizing. Yeah, vaporizing the word. Doing all, yeah, just yeah, making just everything spiritual and floating around out there and not, you know, right. solid. Do not spiritualize, in other words. Quoting again, for surely it is a most unspiritual thing to take the plain word of God and rest it into a confused jingle of words which may mean not anything or nothing. <laughs> as a self-constituted interpreter may elect. We encounter this difficulty, now get this, we encounter this difficulty in the headlines of our King James Bibles, where the translators have no doubt at great pains to educate themselves, and certainly to the quote-unquote Israel is meant... No, no. Oh, what? And certainly to the great injury. Yes, you want to read that? And certainly to the great injury of the people of God sought to elucidate the text. By this process, they changed it that Israel means the church. Zion <laughs> means Jerusalem. Uh, likewise, uh, at Zion, Jerusalem also, they mean the church. Zion means the church. Jerusalem means the church. Until there's nothing left of the real Israel. Right. And nothing left for them but the curses which the King James translators evidently did not want for themselves nor for the church. Now, uh, an example of this right here well, is... Mom, you showed me in your Bible. It's this Bible right here. I like the Cambridge Bible. It has a lot of good references, and it's, uh, it's in King James. But in my Bible, I wrote down... These are just a few. I just wrote them down yesterday. Isaiah 42 and 43. This is the Cambridge University Press. The scripture reads, Shelley, um, if you'll go back to, I'll have you go back here to there. Okay. Uh, read, I, read Isaiah 43, 1. Okay. But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. You see, when God calls Jacob, it means physical Israel. Yes, Israel. Uh, all the sons of Jacob were the 12 the Jews, tribes yes. of Israel. Right. Now, 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 that mentions Jacob and Israel. Right. Now, here is the heading on my Bible. 
Which the editors added. Oh, yeah, people added this. This is yeah, it. This but is the this, heading. But it comes back from King James' time. Right. God comforteth the church with his promises. It's not the church at all. So that's on the same page as Isaiah 43. One. One. And, it, and then Isaiah 44, one. Quote, Yet now hear, O Jacob, my servant, and Israel, whom I have chosen. Thus saith the Lord that made thee, and formed thee from the womb, which will help thee. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, and thou, Yeshua, Yeshua whom I have chosen. Heading. What's the heading? The church comforted. Now, he's that talking to Jacob. He's talking to Israel. False. But the heading is... The church comforted. All right, Isaiah 45, 1. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden, to subdue nations before him, and I will loose the loins of kings, to open before him the two leavened gates, and the gates shall not be shut. For Jacob my servant's sake, and Israel my elect. Israel my elect. I have even called thee by thy name. All right, he called Cyrus by his name more than a hundred years before he was born. Because already, um, and I'll ask them to put up a graphic on this, already the king Nebuchadnezzar, when Babylon came, he saw this great image. And it was all the times of the Gentiles. And it started with him, Babylon the head. Then Babylon would be overthrown by a two-armed uh, empire, the Medo-Persians. And then the Greeks, uh, the belly and the torso, the Greeks would overthrow them. Mm -hmm. And then Rome would come and overthrow with the two iron legs. And then last of all, old Rome, uh, um, iron. Mm -hmm. uh, old, old Rome revived. Mm -hmm. And uh, then the ten toes, part iron and part clay. So that was the times of the Gentiles. Now, so he's already prophesied that Babylon's going to be overthrown. Right. So Cyrus, he called to overthrow Babylon. From the Persian. Uh, Medo-Persians. Medo-Persians. Medo-Persians, Cyrus. Now, he, God, sent him in there while they're having a wild, drunken party with Belteshazzar and, and Daniel and the handwrites on the wall. Outside the door is Cyrus, and he's figured out how to get through that moat that they had around mm -hmm. it and overthrow the Babylonians. Mm -hmm. Now, that's what this is talking about. That's who Cyrus is. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the heading. That the editors have added. That, 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 that they wrote back mm -hmm. in the days of King James. God calleth Cyrus for his church's sake. It's not his church at all. No wonder. Israel is in Babylon. Now, this replacement theology, which comes all the way back... To, to Constantine, of course, you have to know that it's devilish. Yes. Uh, Satan wants to plot the people of God, the church against the, uh, the Jews. And so then they have, they have the church taking the place. So people read through the Bible and they... Uh, no wonder they're confused. They're, they're confused and they put themselves in every scripture. You are not in every scripture. Right. There are three groups of peoples. Right. That's why you need my book, How to Rightly Divert, Divide the Word. The Bible tells us that this is the Word of God, study to show yourself approved unto God, rightly dividing the Scriptures, the Word. If it can be rightly divided, it can be wrongly divided. So when Brother Hagin was teaching this, and I heard him teach it, he said, do you know why... Um, what Paul wrote in uh, 1 Corinthians 7 does not match what Jesus taught on the subject of marriage and divorce in the Gospels. He said it's because they were writing to two different peoples. Right. Jesus was speaking to the Jews living under their covenant. Paul was writing to the church living under the commandment, one commandment of love and interpreting different uh, situations under the law of love. 1 Corinthians 10.32 the Bible says, give no one offense. All the Bible's for the church, but not all the Bible's about the church. This is not about the church. Right. Isaiah 42, 43, 44, 45, the church is not in it. Right. But the church comforted. They got the church up in the headlines there. Yeah, that's and, huge. And, and, and conveniently, they conveniently. get all the blessings, but the curses are still going on to, to Israel.
God's through with them. They're Christ killers. Oh my goodness, if we had time to teach you all of that. But anyway, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10, 32, there are three groups of peoples, the Jews, the nations, the Gentiles, and the third group is the church. Any Jew, any Gentile can believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and come into the third group, the body of Christ. So all the Bible's for the body of Christ, but not all the Bible's about us. And to think that God has plans and futures for each of the three groups of people. Each of those three groups. If they all came in into the church. The Jews. The Jews. Then what would, how, who would fulfill God's promises and blessings for the, say, the millennial, God's earthly people? He promised he'd bring them home. Right. And as that group, then he, they would uh, rule. And to think that the editors or whoever wrote the heading uh, in these, the Cambridge Bible, they weren't led by the Holy Ghost to write that heading. No, no. And so just what that little thimble full of knowledge is enough to um, help so many people. And so many of the early church then, they, uh, they accepted this. Some of the early church fathers, uh, St. John Chrysos, uh, Chrysostom, uh, the golden-mouthed orator, uh, and then I want to say, um, what want, do you want to I say? I want to read this from, um, you see, this came into, let's, let's say it came back from the early church, early, early church writers. And uh, he, he's uh, C-H-R-Y-S-O-S-T-O-M, Chrysostom. He was called the Golden Mouth, one of the greatest of the church fathers, spent his life in and out of the pulpit trying to reform the world. Uh, they described him as a bright, cheerful, gentle soul, a sensitive heart, a temperament, open to emotion and impulse. Yet in this preacher was hidden a hardcore hatred. The violence of the language used by St. John Chrysostom in his homilies against the Jews have never been exceeded by any preacher whose sermons have been recorded. He said about the Jews, the synagogue is worse than a brothel. It is the den of scoundrels, the repair of wild beasts, the temple of demons devoted to idolatrous cults, the refuge of brig brigands, debauchees, and the cavern of devils. A criminal assembly of Jews, a place of meeting for the assassins of Christ. They call them the assassins of Christ. Down through the years, the Christians have gone after them as Christ killers and really tried to shove Jesus by down their throats. Um, I'm going to read here, God deals with the Jews as a, as a unit. As a nation. As a, as a unit. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, um, bless the Lord here. Romans 9, 10, and 11 is God's revelation of Israel those to the church. Those three chapters. Mm -hmm. Now, one of those verses is, speaking of the Jews, God hath concluded them. That's Romans eleven thirty two. 32. Mm -hmm. God hath concluded them all in unbelief that he have, might have mercy upon all all the Jews together. He's concluded them. What is that word concluded? Well, I looked it up somewhere and I, I, it said like in a sack, put them in a sack. Mm -hmm. So I contacted Rick Renner and he gave me this answer. Oh, good. The I word concluded it. is the Greek word, sunakleo, a compound of soon and kleeg. Soon conveys something done jointly. Mm -hmm. Kleeg is the Greek word for a key and was typically used to depict a closed door, a prison shut and locked tightly, or something that is sealed shut and that is under lock and key. When compounded, it forms the word that is translated concluded. In the King James, it actually pictures many who are all jointly put under lock and key. They're locked up together and Unless the one with the key opens the door to let them go from that place, they can't go. They are able to be set free only due to the release granted by the possessor of the key. Since God is the possessor of the key, he is the only one who can open the door by an act of his mercy to let them go free. And so there came a time when God concluded them all together, and now he deals with them all together together. And we see how he reveals Jehovah to them in Ezekiel 38 and 39 war. And then they see their Messiah, uh, the one who was pierced. Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 12, Zechariah chapter 14. And then they become the rulers of the whole earth. So, so 
My part is to love them. And of course, I'm so thankful. Any Jew comes into the body of Christ, he, he's in the body of right. Christ. He's exactly. in the third group now. So tell about your Jacob story. Well, I don't know if I have time. Well, I think you do. Four minutes. If I don't, just go like this. I'll just stop when we stop. But uh, many years ago, and I was in my 40s, and um, we just got in our airplane, and Mom, you had double booked a meeting. And so that very rarely happens, but it happened. So you took the private plane that God had blessed us with to go, and I took public plane out flying out of Springfield to go to Chicago. And the meeting to was... To keep the meeting, I double booked. Yes. And this meeting in Chicago was the very wealthy, wealthy, wealthy people in a big country club setting. And um, I felt very inadequate. You better get to Jacob. Well, I will, Mother, but mm -hmm. I'm just saying, he, he blessed me, and there was a reason why he blessed me. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I felt inadequate. I'll tell the story. Mm -hmm. And so all of that to say, I sat down next to this Jewish man, and uh, I was so thankful that he looked every bit of 75 or 80, <laughs> and um, he began to talk. And I thought, oh, dear God, there's 2,000 years of history, bad history between Christians and Jews. We slaughtered them under the sign of the cross. I hope he doesn't ask me who or what I am. <laughs> Guess what? He asked. He asked lots of questions. Well, what do you do? What do you do? What do you do? So I, reluctantly, I said, I'm a Christian. And immediately I could feel, Mom, this wall go up between us. And I understood why. Thousands of years old. And I said, listen, I'm not that kind of a Christian. Oh, you're not Catholic? I said, no, I'm the kind of Christian that Jesus said, they'll know you are Christians by your love. He goes, well, I've never heard of that. He <laughs> said, uh, and I said, I'm not going to try to push Jesus down your throat. And he said, do you know that our history, Jewish history, they tried to push Jesus down our throat. And if we didn't follow your Jesus, they would throw us into icy rivers or persecute us. And we Jews said, who wants a savior like that? Who has that kind of character that wants to kill? So that's why we weren't attracted to your Jesus. And I said, I know, I know. I go, I know you don't read the book of Romans in the New Testament, but it's, or 1 Corinthians chapter 10, but it does say, give no man offense, including the Jews. So I'm asking you, can you please forgive them? They didn't know about 1 Corinthians chapter 10, give no man offense. And he had a window near the, uh, he could look outside. And for about, I don't know, 30 seconds, it seemed like an eternity. And he looked at me and he said, I forgive. And immediately uh, he turned, it was like the glory. There's just one minute left. I know, I don't have time. And he turned around, his wife Gloria was behind and said, hey, Gloria, my lucky day. So, a goyim is not, a go a goy. it, yeah, is teaching me Hebrew, which I was teaching him a little bit of Hebrew and is not trying to stuff Jesus down my throat. And so when the plane landed, stood up in the aisle to go, and he said, don't leave in front of God and everyone with this loud voice. He said, don't leave without the blessing. And you, he just forgot about everyone else in the plane and loud. He began to pray a blessing on me and the anointing of God came on me and it, it gave me the ability to speak in front of those women at the country club with such a, beyond my ability. And we were there for almost three hours. They wanted more, more, more. There was such an anointing. I would have missed the blessing if I hadn't have blessed him. I think Shelly had given him something and something to drink, and he'd given her something, one of the, and, and she said, Toda. And he yeah. said, What's Toda? Yeah. So then she started teaching him, and he said, Gloria, a Goya is teaching me Hebrew. Right, right. And so everything turned. They'll know you're Christians by your love. That's right. God loves them. They are the apple of his eye. Yes. Shelley and I'll be right back. This is our last session on the subject of anti-Semitism. Now, to be on the Lord's side, you have to know what the word says. You have to know how to rightly divide it. You have to know what the word says about the promises that the land belongs to Israel. And you have to know that right now, surely, judgment of the nations is going on. So true. When they had that court in the Netherlands, Hague. the Hague, they had the Court of International uh -huh. Justice, and they accused Israel 
after Israel was attacked bar 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 barbarously? I thought, the judgment of the nations, yes. you're standing up and you're counting exactly. your vote, and heaven's court is watching. You need to know what the word says. Mm -hmm. And these books are available. There's two more that go with it uh, for $10 plus shipping. And we do ask you to consider, watch again the first session and the video on this place. You'll hear my heart. This place in Israel that God has supernaturally given us for this time. Wow. And then on over, something I even can't tell you. But all the offerings are going to go to Migdal Arbel in Israel. You'll be giving to Israel, our project in Israel. You have to specify Israel project, Migdal Arbel. You can write M-A, but something on your credit card giving or your giving has to say that. And so we'll be with you next week. Shalom, shalom, shalom. shalom. <laughs>